Hi everyone. Just recently a story broke about how a 1969 documentary had been taken down from YouTube after the BBC lodged a copyright claim. That documentary was Royal Family, a film the royals asked to be made in the hope of improving their public image and showing the public their everyday lives. Now after the film was broadcast it was never seen again. The BBC took instructions from the Queen to ban it from ever being screened, although a few clips have been used from time to time in other documentaries. Copies have got out and one was recently posted on YouTube and YouTube took it down and it was reposted an hour later so clearly it's now out there and copies will probably continue popping up now and again for a long time. Now I've written to the BBC to ask why they're allowing the subject of a documentary, the Queen, editorial control and the right to block its broadcast. Now I said to the Director General that it's hard to believe that in other circumstances the BBC would not have chosen to broadcast the film a number of times in subsequent years given the significance of the documentary to the evolution of the monarchy's relationship with the media and the public, not to mention the BBC's enthusiasm for promoting the royal brand. And there is clearly a public and journalistic interest in making the film readily available. So what's all the fuss about? Well, as an act of great sacrifice, I have watched the documentary so that you don't have to. Now here's what I think. So if you like the royals, if you don't expect much of them other than being royal and find their lives interesting, it's unlikely you'll see anything wrong with the film you'll probably wonder why the Queen objects to it being shown, and I think the worry for the royals, though, is perhaps twofold. For a start, it's what they would call over-familiarity. We see them with their guard down, and it doesn't always look good. The other problem is that they come across as odd, but ordinary people who don't appear to do much of anything except attend parties and pursue their own hobbies. The BBC lays on the deference pretty thick with the hushed tones of the narrator and really tries to labour the point that they work hard all year round, as if protesting too much, yet the film shows no actual work being done by the royal family. Early on we're treated to staged scenes of two people giving a reasonable impression of work, but there's absolutely no substance to what they're doing and no evidence that any real work is done at those desks. Part of the unseen job is an office job. Yes, ma'am. Oh, do you think you could bring up those papers that I was looking at yesterday? This um, student's conference at um, Churchill College, the, I can't get there, um, except if I fly, is that right? It's theoretically possible, it's a three-hour drive. The film is pretty heavily padded out with scenes of the royals pursuing hobbies and private interests, whether it's flying, horses, running the Duchy of Cornwall or having dinner. We can look at the inner workings of the busiest royal palace in the world. OK, but the work shown is the work of others, almost all of which is directed at providing the royals with easy, luxury lifestyles. The Queen's work includes deciding what to wear at official engagements for the next eight months, discussing whether she should ask a designer to create a new dress so she has something to wear with a ruby necklace. Ah, this, this fascinating necklace, the time a ruby one. do wish I could uh, find... I think really one ought to get a dress design so that one Especially could wear it, yes. Idly looking at stamps and chatting to people about what's next on her list of official engagements also comes under the definition of work. Foreign office telegrams, Commonwealth papers, information from our ministers, decisions to be taken, rulings to be given, documents to be signed. But what is he talking about? You know, what rulings or decisions does the Queen make? The Royalists are always saying that the Queen has no power, yet they conjure up a fantasy of the busy chairman of Britain PLC. Now, there are a few interesting bits of footage, such as the detail of the royal train. The ten coaches contain three working rooms, three dining rooms, five bathrooms, three kitchens, as well as Prince Philip's room and the Queen's room beyond it. The film unwittingly shows us the absurdity and obscene waste of the Royal Britannia, and there are some interesting walk-on parts by some of the big political names of the time, such as Canada's first Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, Harold Wilson and Richard Nixon. But the lasting impression of dilettantes playing at work and on the whole just playing, their concerns are trivial and their duties limited, not really warranting a lifetime of preparation as some royals claim they have. David Attenborough, who was at the time a controller at the BBC, reportedly wrote to the film's director Richard Corston and he said, You're killing the monarchy. With this film you're making, the whole institution depends on mystique and the tribal chief in his hut. If any member of the tribe ever sees inside the hut, then the whole system of the tribal chiefdom is damaged and the tribe eventually disintegrates. So, so there's pretty ridiculous and patronising nonsense from Attenborough, but there is an element of truth in this. 
that the royals get away with a lot because we rarely see them for who they really are. Now, this film doesn't quite do that, but it does come close, and not in a flattering way. There's no smoking gun, although this cringeworthy, embarrassing scene at the end doesn't look good. To me, uh, there's, uh, there's a gorilla coming in. So I said, you know, what an extraordinary remark to make, very unkind about anybody. And uh, so, you know, I stood in the middle of the room and pressed the bell and the doors opened. And there was a gorilla. <laughs> and I had the most terrible trouble in <coughs> keeping... Did that happen to me? I'd, I'd have to dissolve. Yeah, I don't want to to walk out. <laughs> <laughs> it's not clear which ambassador she's talking about, but as one tweet said the other week, it's unlikely it's the ambassador of Australia or Canada. Despite all this, the BBC does its best to sell the monarchy, ending with the big lie trotted out by so many royalists. While she is head of the law, no politician can take over the courts. While she is head of the state, no generals can take over the government. While she is head of the services, no would-be dictator can turn the army against the people. The strength of the monarchy does not lie in the power it gives the sovereign but in the power it denies to anyone else. Now this is nonsense. One reason the monarchy is tolerated and indulged by politicians is the considerable royal power the Queen hands over to the Prime Minister of the day. That power is excessive and poorly defined, but monarchies worldwide have proven themselves no check on the power of political leaders or would-be dictators. And the British Armed Forces are a professional military that is sworn to take its orders from the elected government of the day. The very idea that the Queen can command the army would be appalling if true, but thankfully it is nonsense. Now, the documentary is back on YouTube from time to time if you do want to watch all 90 minutes of it, although do be sure to stock up on Red Bull before watching it and maybe don't operate heavy machinery for a few hours afterwards. If we get a reply from the BBC, I'll let you know, but if not, I'll write again, because the BBC needs to behave without fear or favour. Now, whether this documentary is flattering or damaging for the monarchy, it should be made publicly available. There is absolutely no reason to keep it hidden away. They could stick it on iPlayer, they could make it available to anybody that wants to watch it. And the fact that they're taking instructions from the Queen to keep this video hidden away is, quite frankly, outrageous. That's it from me. Bye for now.